Hi, and welcome to another episode of Hackers Misadventures in Scale Modeling. Today we're going to do something a little different. Now we all know who Supermarine is. They're the guys that made, made the Spitfire and the Scimitar and a bunch of other aircraft, including some float planes before the Spitfire. Now, and oh yeah, we forgot the the um, full plane ra racing plane that won, won the Snyder Trophy. Anyways, all companies that back in the day that started out sometimes weren't very successful at first. Now we saw. We saw that um, Saversky Air, aircraft, though had put out the P-35, was failing due to its own owner, and that the aircraft wasn't that good, so on and so forth. But in the end, once Republic took over, took them over, they became became a household name, and a lot of the aircraft became legendary. But here's a prime example of a company that's starting out that wasn't legendary at first. And this is Supermarine. Now, we're going to watch it. Ned at Nash's uh, Military Matters video on the Supermarine Nighthawk that was developed during World War I. And just, I find this one interesting. There's no kits of this aircraft. And I don't recall anybody scratch building one. But this is a prime example of first attempt failures. I've watched the video before this because it, I came across it and I'm going like, hmm, didn't know this. So let's watch it and you'll see what I mean. And as I said, there's no, there's no kits of this plane, and I have no, I don't think anybody's ever scratch built one. But in both cases, I could be wrong. But anyways, let's have a watch. Sorry. This has some world-changing examples, and in well, manufacturing, this trend continues. Few let me, have let, me, of, let well, me go back. The list has some world-changing examples. And in manufacturing, this trend continues. Few haven't heard of Rolls-Royce, Savile Row Suits, and Scotch Whiskey. In aircraft, probably the most famous is the Supermarine Spitfire. Renowned for its grace, agility, and formidable combat abilities, this aircraft was, and still is, considered a truly elegant example of aeronautic beauty by many. But in the case of Supermarine, it is very much a situation of a swan springing from an ugly duckling. I mean, just look at one of the first aircraft the company built, the Supermarine Nighthawk. <laughs> what is it to designers and the name Nighthawk? Is it some in-joke between them? Anyway, the Supermarine Nighthawk was created in response to the threat of attack on British cities and towns by German Zeppelins. The first of these occurred in January 1915, and the Royal Flying Corps seemed largely unable to stop them with the primitive aircraft they then had at their disposal. The authorities thought that the raids represented a major threat to the morale of the British public, who, after all, hadn't faced the prospect of actual attack by a foreign power since the Napoleonic Wars. So up stepped Noel Pemberton Billing, an entrepreneur who had founded a new aircraft company bearing his name in 1913 and located in Southampton. Recognising that existing aircraft took too long to reach altitude to intercept Zeppelins and then had insufficient armament to do anything about it if they did, Pemberton Billing proposed a new solution. Their aircraft would be a multi-crew, multi-engine affair that would be massively armed and capable of loitering at altitude for a very long period. The initial design was the PB-29E battle plane, which first flew on the 1st of January 1916 
and crashed later that year. But it was considered promising enough that a more advanced prototype for a potential anti-Zeppelin fighter was authorised. This aircraft was model designated as the PB-31E, but was more commonly known by its company name, the Supermarine Nighthawk. Pemberton Billing had by this point been elected as a Member of Parliament, and too busy now to be involved in corporate affairs, an idea that seems to have fallen out of fashion nowadays, he sold his shares in his aero company. The new owner, Herbert Scott Payne, both continued developing the new aircraft and renamed the company officially as the Supermarine Aviation Company Limited. And amongst the designers that Scott Payne set to work on the Nighthawk was a young Reginald Mitchell. Yes, the Nighthawk was the designer of the Spitfire's first aircraft project. The PB-31E was That's completed in November 1916 and handed over for trials. Though it looks utterly bizarre to modern eyes, the aircraft had many very advanced features. The Nighthawk had a multi-plane wing layout. That is, it had a quadruplane main wing and a biplane tail. The tail in turn featured two rudders. The aircraft was powered by two Anzani 10-cylinder radials, each producing 100 horsepower. However, and in a first for an aircraft, the Nighthawk also had an auxiliary power unit, an ABC generator that produced 5 horsepower. This powered a trainable spotlight that was mounted in the nose, which was envisaged as being necessary for hunting zeppelins in the nighttime when they were on their bombing missions. The auxiliary unit also powered the heating for the cockpit, which was, in a rather novel fashion for the time, fully glazed. But the crew needed this comparative luxury because of the performance capabilities of the Nighthawk. The aircraft was intended to get up to altitude and patrol for long periods of time, as in up to 18 hours. To do this, the Nighthawk carried a tonne of fuel, literally. Maximum fuel capacity was reported to be 2,240 pounds, 1,016 kilograms, and for maximum loiter, the aircraft would only be flying at 35 miles per hour. Hence the need for all the wings. They would provide huge amounts of lift to the aircraft as it drifted around looking for a target at minimal speed. The long patrol times also meant that the crew numbers were variable, and to be honest, somewhat uncertain. Notionally, the aircraft had a three-man crew, but as many as five are thought to have been the intended number. Relief pilots would sit between the cockpit and the forward gun position. In fact, one source I read said that the intention was for there to be a sofa installed in this area for resting crew, but this doesn't seem to have been fitted. The open nose position held both the aforementioned spotlight and a Lewis light machine gun fitted on a scarf ring mounting. But the main gunnery position was located on the very top of the aircraft in what almost looks like a tower position that ended at the top wing. This held another Lewis gun as a secondary weapon, but the main firepower was provided by a Davis gun. This was a 37mm recoilless gun that fired a one and a half pound projectile. The engagement process was envisaged thus. The Nighthawk would get up to altitude in its patrol zone and cruise around, potentially all night and even well into the day. In fact, Zeppelin raids tended to favour the long winter nights to cover their approach and escape, hardly surprising considering their sedate speeds and huge profile. If a Zeppelin was detected or reported attempting a night attack, the intention was for the Nighthawk to use its forward mounting searchlight to locate the enemy. This was flexible to an extent, and that allowed the operator to move it around to acquire the target. Once locked on, the pilot would manoeuvre into position to allow the gunners to engage, principally the main one located in the top position with his Davis gun. That should have knocked a quite satisfactory hole in any airship unfortunate to get within range. So there we have it, an aircraft with long loiter capability, independent acquisition and targeting apparatus, and substantial firepower for dealing with intruding heavy bomber aircraft. What's that sound like? But despite ticking a lot of boxes that would be important for many later aircraft, in fact the Supermarine Nighthawk missed the boat. By the time it first flew in February 1917, the new single-seat fighters coming into service were demonstrating adequate performance for interception, plus enhanced firepower. 
Improved incendiary, explosive and tracer ammunition for the 303 machine guns fitted as standard on these aircraft was capable of setting fire to both Zeppelin and Gotha bombers that were now bombing British towns and cities. This removed the perceived need for a specialist interceptor. Plus, there were doubts on the actual ability of the Nighthawk to perform this one function anyway. In testing, the aircraft demonstrated an absolute top speed of only 60 miles per hour, a speed that a Zeppelin could match in the right conditions. It also took the aircraft an hour to get to an altitude of 10,000 feet, which is just over 3,000 meters. Additionally, the Anzani engine would prove unreliable, though it isn't known if this was considered at the time as part of the decision concerning the Nighthawk. Because the aircraft was scrapped on March 3rd, 1917, with probably less than a month of flight testing. Thus ended the Nighthawk, as far as I'm aware, the world's first dedicated night interceptor. All that remains of the aircraft is a solitary propeller that hangs in the Solent Sky Aviation Museum in Southampton, England. Well, there you go. I thought I'd throw that out to you. Because it's um, rather interesting. Anyways... If anybody knows, if anybody has actually scratch built this one, I'd be interested to know because that would be, going back to the picture of it here, where is that picture? Where's the side profile? There, there's, there's the side profile. There's the side profile. If anybody could scratch built that, I'd give them... 100% kudos, because that would be really complicated. But anyways, I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you, if you like what I'm doing, please subscribe to my YouTube channel and like, like my video. And if you want to support my channel, you can do, do so through my Patreon page or on my um, YouTube channel channel page there's in the banner there's a little um, PayPal button you can you can press to donate and remember every builds an adventure so go make it awesome and I'll see you later and have a good chuckle chuckle at this this video and you have a good day